Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this video is Experiment Designs in Computer Science. This is Topic 6, Sample Sizes. In this video, we are going to review the feedback from the last lecture. So, let's go! Alright, uh, thank you everyone for responding to the feedback survey every week. Um, so let's go through some of the comments that we received uh, in this survey. First, uh, thank you very much for the comments. We got that dates, so we had 37 students are currently in the Japan time zone, GMT plus nine. Um, I don't think that, I think that all of these students are actually currently in Japan, which is great. It's, um, I remember in the beginning of the year, uh, we had about 20 students, well, well, about 15 students that were not in Japan, so I guess most of you managed to come in this meantime. That's great to know. Then we have uh, three students in the Chinese uh, time zone, GMT plus 8. And finally, we have one student in the Brazilian time zone, GMT minus 3. So for the students in the Japan time zone and China time zone, uh, we're going to have the um, online test as usual. For the student in the Brazilian time zone, I will discuss with them uh, separately to see what is the best solution. Okay, uh, then uh, the first question was, what is alpha correction? And I'm happy that almost everyone uh, got this question right. So here's the canonical answer. Alpha correction is to adjust the value of the alpha parameter. So that's the idea. It's a correction of the alpha, all right? So we saw in one of the first class that the alpha parameter determines the confidence of the, of the test. Um, and we define the alpha parameter depending on the requirements of our experiment. And the alpha correction is a technique to change the value of the alpha parameter to take into account the increased possibility of type 1 error from multiple tests. Now, as I said, most of you got this question correct, so even if your answer was a little bit different than this, uh, I think it was probably generally correct. Here are some common errors. One is alpha correct adjusts the probability values. So here is a mistake because this the alpha correction does not adjust the probability. Uh, the probability is the same. The calculations of the probability is the same. What is being changed is the threshold that we use to determine if a certain probability is likely or unlikely. Okay, um, And then we got another comment here that the probability of the study rejecting the new hypothesis. And again, um, I think in this case, the student probably understood the concept, but the sentence is incomplete. This was kind of mostly the entire answer of the student. Because here is what is alpha correct. Yeah, and alpha correction is not the probability. Alpha correction is a correction of the alpha parameter. Okay, so it would be better to write something explicit. Alpha correction changes the probability of the study to reject the new hypothesis. Now, I know many of you have English as a second language, and in that case, my suggestion for you is when you are answering a question, if you have difficulty uh, writing the answer, try to rephrase the question. So, for instance, if the question is, what is alpha correction? Your answer should be, alpha correction is this, 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 and that. Uh, we see often in TV, like, what is alpha correction? Is this, this, this? Um, like, they don't repeat the answer. And if you are sure about your language abilities, it's okay to start a completely new sentence. But my recommendation for you, if you have difficulties with English, repeat the question. What is alpha correction? Your answer, alpha correction is, and then you give the answer. Okay? That helps. Uh, assemble a phrase that is easy to understand. Now, a few answers were very extensive, like four or five sentences. So they started correct, but then they covered details that were not relevant, such as, for instance, if the rejection region is on the right or the left. So another suggestion of mine is try to limit your answer. Do not answer, do not write an answer that is very long. If your answer is too long, then maybe you're adding information that is not related to the question. This is true, not only for this, but also when you write papers uh, or when you prepare research reports, 
Uh, staying to the facts is a very important point when you want to write with clarity, okay? Now, the second question, what do you do if you find a, big out, a few big outliers? Again, uh, most of the students got this correct. So I'm happy that at least for the last lecture, I think most of you got the, um, the ideas of the lecture correctly. Now, the first important point is to investigate the outliers. So that's the first thing. If you have outliers in your experiment, the first important point is to investigate the outliers. You have to understand if they are normal results of the experiment or if they were caused by some error. If they are caused by some error, you need to understand if the experiments need to be redone, if like the error affects all the results, or if the error affects only the outliers, then the error is isolated. If the outliers are caused by isolated errors or by some unique circumstances, it may be okay to just remove them. But if the outliers are a normal result of the experiment, then you need to decide how to treat them. Depending on the number of samples and the size of the outlier, there are several options. You can do non-parametric test, bootstrapping, data conversion, etc., which we discussed last lecture. So some small mistakes in the answers. If the outliers are out of the significance interval. So this is, a, this is wrong because by definition, outliers are always out of the significance interval. And then I sh once just started, I should redo the experiment. Uh, the problem with just redoing the experiment is that this can be very expensive. And we won't talk about this should, about the days on the video today. And if you want, if possible, to not redo your entire experiment. In extreme cases, it might be necessary. But the idea is that we want to think of alternatives to redoing the entire experiment. And then another said, outlier should be excluded. Um, some people just said that we should remove the outlier. And as I said before, this is one option, but it's not always the correct option, as we described above. So if the outliers are a normal part of the experiment, removing them will bias your result. So you need to be careful. Okay. Uh, before I go to the other comments from the students, I want to touch a different point. I mentioned this in the announcements, uh, but uh, in this uh, question, unfortunately, I noticed that one of the students uh, copied the answer for the quiz uh, from a paper in, a pa in an online page. Um, so this is what we usually call plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you use the work of another person and pretend it's your own work. Okay. Oh, but uh, don't we use, don't we cite the work of other people in our research? Yes. And citation is very different from plagiarism. So it's important that you know the difference. When you cite the work of other people, you make it very clear what is your work and what is the work of others. So you can say something like, um, Mr. Tanaka said that in this book, so-and-so book, that um, alpha correction is defined by this. That's one answer. Another is when you just said alpha correction is defined by this, and you took that information from Mr. Tanaka's book, but you did not give him attribution, which means that you are making his work look like yours, and that would be plagiarism. Uh, in science, um, there is a lot, it's very, very important that uh, your uh, discoveries are attributed. If you make a discovery, you don't want someone else to say, oh, that's my discovery, when it's your discovery, right? So that's why in the scientific, uh, the scientific society, um, who did what work is a very important uh, point. Of course, uh, when we do research, we use information from many people, but in that case, each information that we use from other people, we are very clear to give proper attribution. It's just the, how do you say, the nice thing to do, right? If you use the work from someone, you want to say, oh, the work from this person was really good, because that will reflect well on that person. Of course, this is the theoretical part. 
Um, and in practice, uh, if you do plagiarism, uh, there are lots of penalties uh, that can happen, such as, like I mentioned in the announcement, if you, are in, if you do plagiarism in a class, uh, you can lose credit for the entire, the entire semester. If you do plagiarism in a paper, uh, the paper, of course, will be retracted, but the authors of the paper, uh, the uh, journals and conferences can refuse to accept papers from them in the future. If the paper was based on some research funding, the funding might need to be returned. Uh, if you are part of a research um, um, research company, uh, you might be fired by doing plagiarism. So it's a very serious uh, problem. Um, and I like you to, very, to all to be very careful. Plagiarism also involves uh, sometimes copying information from the internet. So there was one student that I remember that they showed me the first version of the thesis and the thesis had images that they took from the Wikipedia. And they thought, oh, everyone can access data from the Wikipedia, so I can just use image from the Wikipedia. Well, setting aside problems of using data from the Wikipedia in your research, data that was used in the Wikipedia, even though it's open source, it still has an author and you still have to cite the author. So even if when you use open source code or even when you use open source images or when you use open source text, you still have to say who was the person who wrote the text, who made that image, who prepared that code. So you need to cite. Open source means that you can use, but you still need to give proper citation especially in research. Finally, um, there are times that even citation is not appropriate. Uh, this is especially uh, in lectures, right? For instance, in the case this uh, survey, the objective is for me to evaluate how much you understand the class. If you copy the answer from a book, even if you cite the book, then I don't know if you understood the question or not. I know that you can search in the book and that's very nice, but what I really want to know is if you understood the topic or not. So for the quizzes and for the final examination, uh, you are not supposed to use external, um, external references. For the final examination, and I will explain this again closer to the final examination, you are allowed to prepare one page of hand notes. So you can prepare one page of notes by hand and you can use that as a reference during the final examination. But you cannot use other sources. You cannot access the internet to check the answers during the final examination, okay? <clears throat> All right, so that's uh, the important notes. Now let's go to the comments from the other students. So one student asked, will the Kruska Wallace test and Friedman test we'll discuss in detail in future lectures I uh, hope so. Uh, maybe we'll touch uh, the Friedman test again in the next lecture, but I'm not 100% sure yet, so um, let's see. If you have more questions about the Kruska Wallis and the Friedman test, please feel free to ask them during the forum of off hours, then we can talk about this test in detail. Until last week, I was able to catch up with a class because I have knowledge of statistics, but this class is the first time for know the contents and is difficult. So if you, again, if you have any problems, uh, send a message in the forum. If it's difficult for you, it's probable that it's also difficult for the students. So if you ask a question in the forum, uh, when I have some time, I can answer the question in the forum and the other students can also read the answer. Today topics is difficult because I cannot understand main Whitney U test. Okay, so let me try to explain the main Whitney U test again. So the idea is that the main Whitney U test is the equivalent to the t-test of two samples when the data is ordinal. So what is ordinal data? Ordinal data is data that can be ordered but it's not necessarily possible to do odd algebra. For example, we talked about Likert data. Agree strongly, do not agree, agree slightly, I'm neutral. So Likert data, you cannot do algebra in Likert data, but you can order it. So because you can order it, you can do a test based on the relative orders of different observations. Another example is the classification in tournaments. The classification in tournaments, first place in the tournament, second place in the tournament, third place in the tournament. You cannot do algebra in that, 
but you can order it. So you can use the Mann Whitney U test. The new hypothesis of the Mann Whitney U test is that the two samples come from the same distribution, so the order of two samples should be well shuffled. So if we say that sample one is the placement in tournaments of team A, and sample B is the placement of tournaments in TB. If we think that team A and TB are equal, sometimes TA will go on top, sometimes TB, team B will go on top, but if we mix the two samples, the A and B will be well mixed. However, if team A is better than team B, then the order of team A will usually be above the order of team B. Okay, so that's what the main witness U the main witness U test tests. Okay, to test this hypothesis, we count the rank of each observation in the two samples. That's how we calculated the U score. And for the calculation of the U score, look again at the material of last class. So this is a way to calculate a random variable that follows. So the U score should follow a normal distribution. So this is a way to calculate a variable that follows a normal distribution using an ordinal variable. Okay, another comment. In the design of the second experiment, if I consider some instruments that I have, I can measure weight, temperature, and length. What are some other variables that I could consider to measure? Now, I would like you to give more detail about your question uh, because I think that this had some context. But when I answer these comments, as you see, I usually don't store information about who asked the question. So I don't know what was your experiment. So maybe if you could write this as a question in the forum, it would be more interesting. Just one thing to note is that in this course, we are mostly considering one uh, factor analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about mood factor analysis in the next class, but um, not too much. Sorry, can you give more details about your question? Yeah, that's what I might comment. Okay. How does researchers know what test to use? By studying a lot of statistics. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, you cooperate with a statistician and you think about what you want to do and uh, you search, okay, I have my data is in this shape, my data is this kind, uh, my data is real, is ordinal, I have two samples, I have 10 samples. I have two factors, I have one factor, I have five factors. So based on all this information, you can decide which test you use. Can choosing tests for analysis be automated? To a certain degree, yes. There are some programs that do automated testing for some very specific tests for experiment. This is not very wide yet, but if someone could automate this further, it would be very appreciated. Just remember that the choice of a statistical test needs to be done before the experiment is done. If you choose the statistical test after you have the data, you will start to introduce bias in your experiment. I think to this point there are many tests and procedures. It would be cool if you could see some type of flow chart. That's true. It would be very nice if there was some sort of flow chart with all the possible tests. And I think that if you look for like flow chart of statistical tests, Let's see what Google tells us. Oh, flowchart of statistical tests. Here, there are a few flowcharts of statistical tests that we can look. So, for instance, this one. Association between two variables. <clears throat> yes, that's what we have been seeing. The two variables are continuous. Yes. Linear regression, correlation analysis. Not association between two variables. The variables are independent continuous, only one dependent variable, multiple linear regression, mixed model. This is more for the design though, right? Um, so two variables are continuous, no independent variables, categorical data. Mm, um, this is a little bit, mm, a little bit strange, this, this chart. There are different ways. Yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure of this chart. There is another one here. So yeah, you can find some flowcharts for statistical testing. So as some other student requested, could you please give more examples? So I just uploaded yesterday a new example made by the TA on Manaba. Take a look at it. I think it will be very useful to know a little bit more about how to think about the test in the context of a computer science experiment. Are we going to Japan next week? I would like to ask if this course may become offline. 
not this year but uh, next year we the probably the course will be offline thanks a lot for clarifying you're welcome i'm considering an experiment sorting algorithms by my second report i would like to ask about pairing on two factors so in general we will focus on test for one factor in the last lecture i will talk a little bit about test for two factors but that's a more advanced topic that we will not cover here but in general uh, you want to focus one factor for your analysis and randomize or block the two factors. I'm going to talk about randomization and blocking in the next class. All right, uh, these were the comments for today. Thank you everyone for your comments. Uh, this is now the seventh lecture, topic six. So we have three more lectures until the end of the course. Just a little bit more. See you all there. Bye-bye.